Evening everybody, great to be with you again in the Word of God this week as we follow along with the Moravian Daily Text and we're drawing, I guess, towards the um, concluding part of this first letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. And um, I don't know about you, but I, I suspect it's a letter that I, I've rather neglected um, and I found it to be just immensely encouraging, um, challenging and enlightening. Um, and I, I think largely I'd overlooked its teaching, at least in these, the, the earlier chapters. But we're coming now to verses that, if we do know anything about First Thessalonians, it's probably these passages. Because um, here we are now in chapter 4, um, running from verse 13 and into chapter 5 and verse 3. And this is a, a relatively well-known passage, being one of the... Um, the, the, the more significant passages um, in uh, the epistles about the coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus to the world. Um, now, what is the context for this? Well, we understand this really right from the get-go of this passage because Paul says to them, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. Uh, by, by this he means those who have passed away already that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, what's happened here? Well, a couple of things. One, we know that Paul was, as it were, torn away um, from the Thessalonians by uh, circumstances of persecution. Um, and so there's probably gaps in the teaching that Paul had wanted to give to them, and he's filling in those gaps now. And we can understand, or infer at least, um, that they also, as a body of believers, a family of faith, have um, endured the loss of loved ones. And so in the absence of clear teaching and going through the pain of loss and of grief, that they're wrestling with this, like, what has happened? Has something gone wrong? Uh, and what has happened to our loved ones? Have they missed out on the coming again of Jesus and the blessed hope that we have all been you know, rejoicing in and hoping for in Christ Jesus. And Paul is glad to be able to teach them. And the, the strong sense here, both at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, when it's concerning the, the, the days and the times, um, it's of reassurance and not of rebuke, um, both in their grief and in their speculation, perhaps driven out of anxiety, uh, the not knowing, um, Paul is seeking to reassure and not rebuke. You see, there's nothing wrong at all for the Christian to grieve. Um, indeed, we're actually instructed biblically to mourn with those who mourn. Um, and you know, the, the scriptures teach us that yes, um, after seasons of mourning come seasons of again rejoicing, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't um, go through appropriately and healthily um, seasons of grief. Um, what we can learn here is that the way that we grieve and yet hope is a Christian distinctive that speaks into a world, um, a world that, that really doesn't know how to handle um, these things. Look, earlier in chapter 4, um, Paul has instructed them according to lives pleasing to God that will speak um, a Christian distinctive into the world. You know, he's just told them to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, work with your hands, um, so that it's indicative, it speaks to people who are outside the church. When we come to think of matters of death, this, I would suggest, is probably one of the most significant ways that Christians can speak a difference and a distinctiveness into our world. Um, within the the, the Greco-Roman world, uh, of which Thessalonica was a part, loads of epitaphs that we know of from the first century in the Greek world, they're hugely pessimistic about death. Um, th there's a desperation and a, a nihilism. It's just the end and, and where is the meaning and what's the purpose and they're just the agonies of loss. I mean, there's not really much else. And we live in a, a cultural context where um, I would suggest most people who, who aren't of faith in Jesus, they really do everything within their power to try and um, uh, comfort themselves or guard themselves against really having to deal with death. Um, we live in a, a culture whereby um, 
funerals um, are almost uh, largely replaced by a celebration of life. Um, many people use language around the idea of, you know, when, when they lose a loved one, of heaven gain, uh, gaining another angel, of, or of a, a lost loved one gaining their wings. And, and this kind of language, which really has no, no basis in, in the Bible, um, really has no basis in anything. Um, this kind of language is used understandably because people are trying to attend to the, the horrors of death and the grief and the pain that they feel. Now, whether our culture would tend towards nihilism or towards um, really kind of just telling ourselves sweet-sounding lies to make ourselves feel better, what the Bible offers here is true comfort, true comfort for the believer and an invitation then to anyone else. Look, here is your hope in death. Grieve, but not without hope. Because if your life is in Christ, and if the, these loved ones who have been part of the Thessalonian church, they're in Christ, then actually, you know, they're, they're not lost eternally. You know, the Bible teaches us, um, and, and that, you know, we can interpret the scriptures slightly differently, but I think we understand that when somebody dies, although bodily they are dead, yet spiritually there is, a, as it were, an intermediate state, whether it is a, a spiritual sleep or whether it is, a, a, you know, a conscious um, presence with the Lord, different interpreters ten different ways but we know that for those who have passed away before the return of Christ they will be resurrected just as Jesus was bodily resurrected and body and soul spirit together they will be resurrected wholly and completely and um, and, and then Paul then gives this absolute joy for the believer that those who are resurrected will and precede um, those who remain. It's really interesting that the way Paul talks about the language. Um, he says, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. There's this strong sense, isn't there, in the language of Paul, that he was anticipating that he might remain alive on the day of Jesus' coming. And we know that that, that isn't how it went. Paul did pass away, he was martyred, in fact, for his faith in Jesus and his gospel courage um, but it's always been the way for, for for any Christian who really has a devotion towards Christ and a longing for his coming any Christian who's committed to the work of the gospel they've been the kind of people who have felt and strongly lived as though Jesus was coming tomorrow and um, you think about people like Martin Luther or John Wesley they believed so strongly that Jesus was coming any moment uh, and this ought to be our impulse as well not only a longing for the coming of Christ, but an expectation that shapes and forms the way that we live and invest ourselves. Right. So those who have passed away before the coming of Christ will be resurrected and they'll precede those who are alive and remain, but together we'll be caught up in the air with Christ and we're going to meet with him, meet the Lord in the air. That word meet um, is indicative of, of, of a visiting dignitary and that was the language that they would have used in the, the culture of the day. If a dignitary was coming and then all of the all of the, the serfs, the ordinary folks, would come to meet with the, the, this glorious being, how much more so with Christ? It's going to come through the clouds, whether clouds natural or clouds of his glory. He's going to come through the clouds. We will all will be caught up, whether resurrected or alive and remaining, to be with him. And, and so we will always be with the Lord, therefore encourage one another with these words. This is the strong sense here. Look, if you're a believer and, and maybe you're feeling the, um, uh, you know, just that, that the natural decays of age within your life, maybe you're wrestling with some really tough things in your health, or maybe you have loved ones who are very closely and, and, and keenly facing um, the, the prospect probability of death. This is very, very tough. The grief begins before the loss, doesn't it, truthfully? But we don't have to grieve as though we have no hope. I would urge you, you know, look carefully at these things. Consider death, your own passing, your own mortality. Do the work, even do the work before you have to. It's the best time to start. And to think about how will I handle this grief, the grief of the loss of my loved ones, of my own mortality, and how 
can I live that blessed hope of the reality of being caught up together with Christ? Now, just a last word. Um, chapter 5 begins, concerning the times and seasons, brothers and sisters, uh, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Uh, much misunderstanding has come about from passages like this. Look, um, anything that you understand about the resurrection to come or, or the coming again of Christ, it's not just kind of common currency. It's not commonly known within our world. We know what we know because of passages like this in First Thessalonians. These are the truths that we ought to really peer into and pour over and then cling to with, with both hands. Um, and what is being said here? Well, times and seasons. Jesus himself has said, hasn't he, um, that, that nobody knows the day or the hour, only the Father. Um, but, but Paul, like we've said here, he's not rebuking them about, you know, idle speculation. You know, Jesus, you know, when um, Peter speculated about about john uh, whether he would remain until the coming again of christ uh, there's a sense of a slight rebuke isn't there toward peter just you know occupy yourself what you need to occupy yourself with do the work here um it's reassurance they're clearly a grieving people um and paul is tender-hearted toward them uh, but but he does say some important things like a thief in the night verse three uh, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labour pains come upon a pregnant woman. What do we need to understand? Well, this phrase, the day of the Lord, it's not new to Paul. This is classic Jewish language. The day of the Lord. Read your prophets, both the major prophets and the minor prophets. It's all the way through there. And the day of the Lord is a day of reward for the faithful ones of God, but it's also a day of judgment and punishment for the wicked and those who have dealt wrongly with God. Within the Christian context, we understand this. Wickedness is to reject Christ and live in sin. The righteousness of the faithful is to receive Christ and be made right by him. Um, we, we're not pompous or proud about this, but we do affirm it matters what you do with Jesus and with the gospel. It really does. And on the day of the Lord, the day of his coming, like a thief in the night two things about a thief unknown and also not looked for <laughs> um and not looked for because sudden destruction sudden destruction upon the wicked upon those who are not in christ who are far from god but for everybody it's unknown a thief comes unknown now oftentimes this has been inferred then as though somehow it's 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 quiet and unexpected um you know there's much um given wasn't there about the uh, you probably maybe you're familiar with the, the left behind series of books and, and 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 movies that were made even another one that was made recently with nicholas cage bless him he makes some fantastic movies and some utterly appalling ones as well doesn't he um god bless nicholas cage um but um look the, the left behind sense was that somehow it would just be quiet and unexpected and that you know people would wake up one day and load of people would have been vanished um, in this idea of the rapture. The scriptures don't allow for that at all. What have we been told in chapter 4? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. This is loud. This is very significant. This is, uh, And he's come through the clouds of glory. Um, there is no way whatsoever that this is an, this is a quiet thing that you know you could largely just miss and then look for your mate and wonder where they've gone it's a total misrepresentation of the way in which jesus will receive people to himself um and and again um look what analogy does paul use as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman it is very rare it's occasional but it's very rare that a lady doesn't know that she's pregnant um the signs are there, aren't they? There's so much that speaks to what is coming. But then there's that, that uncertainty about well, exactly when. When is this baby going to come? We know babies a couple of weeks early, a couple of weeks late, and, and sometimes very quickly. Um, and, and sometimes with, you know, the, the cry of an archangel, uh, some other noises. Um, look, it's not unexpected. We don't know all the detail, but we know enough. And what does a pregnant woman do? Prepares. 
prepares, gets everything ready, works, strives, longs, is eager for what is coming. It's going to be difficult. There are certainly there are pains around death and loss. There are going to be pains and and all sorts of uh, things around the day of the coming of the Lord. But for those who are faithful, who, who understand what is coming, you prepare. And you, you earnestly long for these things. You don't, you know, when, when labour comes, you don't, a woman doesn't grieve as though she has no hope. It's a very difficult process, but she has hope. And this is how the Christian ought to live. Um, in the face of death, in the longing for the day of the coming of the Lord. Um, I hope that's been helpful. Um, it may have raised more questions than it's answered. If you've got lots of questions, plump them there in the comments chat along let's chat about these things let's help one another i want to pray with you right now before i let you go uh, for the rest of your evening Uh, god bless you let's pray jesus we thank you for two things we thank you for the resurrection and we thank you that you are coming again lord jesus we thank you that because you have risen from the dead and conquered the power of death that lord jesus we who are in you also know victory over death it has no sting for us God, help us. Help us no matter where we are in in our life and and whatever's going around us with our loved ones. Help us to face death Christianly, to understand, think through these things and to live through these things, um, even to die according to the gospel of grace. We thank you also that you're coming again. You've given us all the clarity that we need so that we might live towards your coming. Help us in these things, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you and uh, God keep you and look forward to seeing you through the week as we go on. Good night.